Hey, it's Jordan. Uh, happy to be joined by Shama Sawant, former uh, Seattle City Council member, proud socialist, uh, and now uh, is with Workers Strike Back. You're actually there in Chicago. And uh, I wanted to first ask you, because uh, on Monday night, uh, it was uh, unsurprisingly uh, the theater inside uh, of the DNC did not match the uh, reality outside. Uh, there was one mention of protests outside uh, by President Biden. And I'm sure you've seen that uh, protesters uh, who protested during Biden's speech uh, were quickly removed. Uh, somebody tried to yank their sign uh, that said stop funding Israel. And the DNC even dimmed the lights, dimmed the lights over them. Uh, can you kind of describe, uh, it, it really seems like it's an alternate reality inside versus outside. I think that's a good way of describing this sort of an alternate reality playing out, as you said, in a theater inside the DNC, which is completely divorced from the reality, not only of the protests uh, in Chicago, but the reality of the vast majority of American working people who are both against the genocidal war on Gaza and are demanding an immediate permanent ceasefire and the reality, the grotesque reality facing the Palestinian people where they're, they, they are being subjected to just uh, unspeakable horrors. And it is uh, quite something to observe how uh, it's been already, you know, it's just, it was just one day of the Democratic National Convention and already that first day featured a who's who of Democratic Party elite who made their predictable speeches. But I think what stood out especially in the theater from yesterday at the first day of DNC was the speeches of UAW President Sean Fain and squad member AOC. And to, just to see how far they are going to give cover to the democratic establishment, especially in the context of unions, including UAW having passed these five resolutions. Yeah, I, I make no, I make no uh, secret that, uh, you know, I covered the UAW strikes. I thought I thought they accomplished a great deal. Uh, I could even understand possibly uh, the endorsement of Biden, but uh, the lengths that uh, Fain and the UAW are going to support him, it does not match what Biden has done for labor. Uh, and no, absolutely not. And and you know and and it, it was it was stunning to me. I mean, as myself as a socialist, as a former rank and file member of the teachers union. To see how, and, and as somebody who was, you know, a working class representative in Seattle for 10 years, to see Sean Fain use the language of the labor movement, of the militant labor movement in service of this clearly anti-worker and pro-war, not only the administration, but the Harris Walls candidacy. Because, you know, Sean Fain said that, uh, who, you know, he, he, he's in, in, in exhorting people to support the Harris candidacy, he said, whose side are you on? I mean, that's just shocking for me because whose side, whose side are you on means, are you on the side of the working class or on the side of the bosses, the capitalists who exploit billions of workers? So to use this language, to co-opt this language in such a dramatically dishonest manner in service of a of both a candidacy and a party that serves the interests of the billionaire class, I really think we have to call this out. Yeah. I want to ask you broader because I think you, for those that don't know you, uh, because we have new viewers watching tonight, uh, you, I think, have accomplished more than any progressive in America, actually elected. <laughs> uh, you, uh, along with socialists and uh, community activists in Seattle, won the $15 minimum wage. Uh, you know, squad members, progressives elected, uh, they present that they've won some things, but not the things they ran on. Um, and what I really want to ask you is, what is the road forward and how does the left achieve concrete structural change? Because there are some say, you know, again, saying, hold your nose, let's defeat Trump, and then we'll fight uh, uh, Kamala Harris. Well, they said they would fight Joe Biden. That didn't happen. Uh, there are others saying third party is the only way, but you've actually achieved success and won concrete policies as an elected official. So can you give us the roadmap? How do we do that on the local level, whatever the label, progressive, socialist, doesn't matter. 
uh, because I know I am tired of covering progressive candidates that once they get in, they might share our values, but they certainly do not seem to have a strategy to win anything. Yes, you're totally right. I've also seen this is just a pr procession of self-prescribed progressives or left Democrats or even socialists, actually, since Bernie Sanders ran his first campaign in 2016 for president as an open socialist. We've seen these candidates, and let's assume many of them are well-meaning to begin with, which I do believe many of them are, but when they get into office, when they uh, acquire these positions where they are put under intense pressure from the establishment, from the, the big business establishment, I mean, the big business entities that actually control the Democratic and Republican parties, then they crumble. And the way they do it is by justifying to themselves, rationalizing to themselves that I'm actually still on the left. I'm just being pragmatic. You know, this is the sort of rationalizing you see AOC having done, you know, she talked about how, well, I'm, I, I want to win 15, I want to win Medicare for all, but this is the way you do it. Because if you defy the democratic establishment, to use her own words, you cause relational harm. And so uh, I want to clarify though, that this, this type of pressure is always present. It is relentless. It never goes away. So I think for, for viewers who are watching this, I think we have to be 100% clear. There is no universe where we can have ourselves become, you know, acquire leadership positions or promote others as uh, into these leadership positions and expect that somehow magically there's going to be some space somewhere, some time at some point in the future where our uh, people who are in leadership positions will not face those pressures. That pressure is always going to be there because that is the way in which capitalism addresses any kind of challenge to itself. That is the way in which the bosses, the billionaires, the people who hold the power under this capitalist system are going to make sure that any challenge to their system is diffused by, and the best way they can diffuse these challenges, really the most effective way for them is to just buy out, you know, to, to have people sell out. And it's not always in the form of millions of dollars. Like, you know, AOC has not acquired millions of dollars in return for selling out. But what, what you see happening is that if you don't, I mean, if you, if you don't, if you, or if you, if you uh, want to stand up to these pressures, then what happens is that the Democratic Party elite, the big business entities, you know, like Jeff Bezos, all these billionaires, they will make your daily life a living hell. And if you don't understand that that is what you have to sign up for, in, in, the, in other words, you have to withstand those challenges. And the only way you can withstand those challenges, those pressures, is by using your office to build wider movements. And that is exactly why we won the first minimum dollar, a $15 minimum wage in, in this uh, in the nation, we won the Amazon tax, we won unprecedented renters' rights. And actually, if you look at the statistics, if you add up all the victories that we won in Seattle through our socialist fighting worker organizing approach through our office, we have actually won billions of dollars for working people. We have, if you count up all the $15 victories that were won after Seattle because they were inspired by our victory, millions of workers have been raised to $15 an hour and, and in cities like Seattle, actually the wages are $20 an hour. And they are far from enough, but this is these are the only victories. I'll just tell you, when I, uh, you know, when we won the $15 minimum wage in 2014, this is now 10 years ago, many journalists asked me, you know, 10 years from now or 15 years from now, how would you uh, measure your success? And my response to them always was that if 10 years from now, we are still talking about our Seattle victories as the only victories that have been achieved. That will be a, a statement on the left that we are actually not seeing the strategies being used on the left that need to be used. And that's why it is true, unfortunately for us, as you correctly said, that the example we set in Seattle is the only example. And that's why I, I urge people to join Workers Strike Back because the reason we founded Workers Strike Back was to take these ideas that have been shown to be so successful to take them nationally. And it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, the main thing you did uh, that separates you from, frankly, Obama, who 
he had a digital army. I mean, he had an organizing army. Obviously, he did not mean the things he ran on, but he had the infrastructure and then left them on the White House lawn. Uh, Bernie, you could say. I mean, he had a, his Slack channel was bigger than DSA. Uh, and after his two runs, he kind of did not utilize his massive activist army uh, to put pressure. Or, or It seems that you, you didn't just get elected and then say, all right, I'll, I'll let you know how it goes to the people who got you elected. You, they were one with you and you worked together. And that's what we're not currently seeing. Yes, that is you. What you, the, what you described is basically in a nutshell what we mean when we say a fighting strategy. A fighting strategy means, first of all, that you understand as a leader, whether you're elected or you emerge as a leader of a social movement like Black Lives Matter or the anti-war movement, you understand that your role there is not to carry out a so-called compromise. And I say so-called because it's never a compromise. It's a capitulation. Uh, your role is not to negotiate some kind of peace where actually working people and the anti-war movement get completely screwed and you uh, handed hand victories to the democratic elite on a platter. No, your role there is to disrupt politics as usual. Your role there is to organize a fight back. And I agree with the terminology used that you have to organize the army of the working class because this is class war. And if we don't organize a fight back of working people by mobilizing and organizing the rank and file of both the labor movement and workers who are not unionized, there is absolutely no pathway to victory. And this is the tragedy. And this, these are the lessons we have to learn from uh, the failures and ultimately, unfortunately, the betrayals by Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders absolutely had an, had an army of the working class at his disposable had he wanted to do uh, the kind of organizing that we did uh, except you know we did it in seattle he could have done it on a national scale or, or, and because you know remember even uh, e even in one of some of his first rallies in around october of 2015 he had tens of thousands of people attending his rallies and by the time it was january or february it was it was millions of people who were so inspired electrified by his message of a political revolution against the billionaire class, a $4 or $15 an hour minimum wage, Medicare for all, taxing the wealthy, making college free, all of these people, there is no shortage of desire for fight back from the rank and file, from the millions of working people. What is there is a shortage of real leadership. And so you saw Bernie absolutely refusing to use that strategy. And then when you use refuse to use that strategy, what happens? they vanquish you his his campaigns in both the 2016 and the 2020 primary completely got vanquished but rather than run as an independent which is what we were urging socialists like myself were urging him to do he instead capitulated each time you know endorsing hillary clinton and this time actually he just he didn't even make an attempt he just he endorsed uh, biden hours after his re-election campaign was announced and now he has capitulated and endorsed Kamala Harris, and the, the same story applies to AOC as well. Had she wanted to organize, had she wanted to use her congressional position to organize, she could have done that. She said we couldn't force the vote. You know, a couple of years ago, we this debate happened where we said that she should not, uh, she, she and other squad members sh should not just hand over their vote to Nancy Pelosi and others in the Democratic elite, and instead they should use their leverage, their numerical leverage to organized to win $15 an hour and Medicare for all. But the one of the main components of that, which I was suggesting that they should do, is that they use their positions to organize mass rallies around Medicare for all. I also think that the responsibility lies at the doorstep of the vast majority of the labor leadership also, which has refused to mobilize ordinary people. And, and what you see, what you saw in the DNC uh, on display last night with Sean Fain's speech, I think part and also AOC speech. What what, what you saw was, uh, you know, the the Democratic elite being quite nervous about the fact that ordinary working people, including in the labor movement, are actually fed up with both parties and they they do want to fight back. Last year was the year with the largest number of workers going out on major strike actions, meaning strikes that included a thousand workers or more than any other year 
since 1986. So there is a historic shift in consciousness that is happening where a whole generation of young people, including young workers in the labor movement who want to fight back. And so what you see is the Democratic Party using the, this kind of power play by, uh, by running Harris, by basically crowning Harris as the candidate and lining up all these leaders in the labor movement who say that, oh, she is, uh, she is, she stood up with work, working people and all of that and completely forgetting that the uh, Biden-Harris administration broke the railroad workers strike. They broke their promise for a $15 an hour minimum wage. They broke their promise to cancel student debt. So it's a litany of broken promises combined with being the warmonger in chief. This is what you have on offer. And that is why it's really crucial that working people break from the Democratic Party. So part of the strategy, you know, your question was uh, initially was, what is the strategy? What is the way forward? The way forward has to be mass movements that are independent of the Democratic and Republican Party. So at this moment, the most urgent question is for the anti-war movement to break from the Democrats and Republicans saying no Harris, no Trump, we want our own political candidates. And that's why Workers Strike Back has endorsed Jill Stein, who is the most viable anti-war pro-worker left candidate for president. This is extremely important, not because we think she's going to win, but it's a stepping stone to begin building our own party for working people. And just lastly, I'll say, the the in my view, the most important highlight that workers who are watching this should take home from yesterday is the launch of the abandoned Harris campaign. The abandoned Biden movement that was launched by especially by the Muslim and the Arab American community, they have now launched abandoned, abandoned Harris. We had a press conference where they announced this. It's important that everybody join this message of no Harris, no, no Trump, and that we need the largest possible vote for Jill Stein. Absolutely. And my last question, um, for, for a third party, uh, I understand, I mean, we're being honest with the audience that Jill Stein, a third party, is not going to win on the federal level right now. But I have always warned people, you know, don't get it twisted that the, the, the promised land is just leaving the Democratic Party and building a third party. You, if, if you think it's rigged in the Democratic Party, watch what they'll try to do, you, do to you as a third party. And we're seeing what they're doing to Jill Stein, uh, to Matthew Ho on the local level in New, New Hampshire, uh, North Carolina. Uh, Michigan just threw Cornell West off uh, the ballot in Michigan to build that third party. How do you counter the army of lawyers, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party has the media machine to either disappear third party candidates, not cover them or smear them? How do you build that infrastructure to to challenge legally uh, a media strategy and, and everything you need to actually become viable? Not right now, but. In, in the short and long term? Yeah, first of all, Jordan, uh, I appreciate you noting. I mean, we have to be um, grounded in reality and it is crucial that leaders on the left never uh, lie to the working class, never give false hope. So I think it is important for us to understand the impact that the Democratic Party has had by moving Biden out and installing Harris as the candidate. Their, their attempt which I think has had a lot of impact, unfortunately, is to confuse a lot of people with Harris and Walls going around calling themselves joyful warriors. Harris murmuring support for ceasefire, saying she has humanitarian concerns about what's happening in Gaza. And yet at the same time, as the vice president presiding alongside Biden over $23 billion of new funding to the Israeli military since she was crowned as candidate. So you see this. Uh, just blatant double speak that is happening uh, from from you know coming across from them, uh, but the you know the uh, it's important for us to recognize that uh, that's what's happening. Uh, that a lot of people unfortunately might want to believe that well it's going to be Harris or Trump as president in January, so might as well get behind Harris. And I think uh, you know we have to we have to uh, make it clear that yes, it is going to be Harris or Trump that's going to be president, but either way, it's going to be a new warmonger in chief. There is no way of getting away from that bitter reality. Either Democrat or Republican going to take the White House, you're going to have a new warmonger in chief. In other words, 
the warmongering and anti-worker agenda is going to continue. It's just going to be a new figurehead, or in Trump's case, it'll be an old figurehead come back. And so uh, the only hope of us fighting back is step number one for us to understand where we are, have a sober assessment of where we are. And yet, despite the difficulties, despite the uh, obstacles in our path, because a lot of people may have illusions in Harris, we, on those of us who are on the left, those of us who want to build a new party for working people, those of us who understand that neither Harris nor Trump offers a way forward, we have to, to yet, despite those difficulties, offer a way forward. And at this moment, I think concretely, it is important for us to understand whether Jill Stein wins hundreds of thousands of votes or a few million of votes, either way, every vote for Jill Stein counts because every vote for Jill Stein is a vote against genocide, is a vote in favor of American working people winning $25 an hour age, Medicare for all through a fight back. Obviously, it's not going to happen magically. And in contrast, every vote for Harris or Trump is going to be a vote for genocide, a vote against striking workers, a vote against working people winning against the billionaire class. And so we have to look at it from that standpoint that it's not, it's it's the, the battleground is not going to end on November 5th. At the same time, it is part of the battleground from now until November 5th. So we have to see it as a continuum and understand that what actions we take today will either set us up better or worse for uh, what we can do come January and February. And so what we are uh, urging working people to do from Workers Strike Back is that we have to fight for every vote for Jill Stein because this is what this is why it matters. And then take that as a platform to have an organizing conference in February, which working Workers Strike Back is calling for so that we can map out our way forward for a new party for working people because Either way, we are going to have a warmonger in chief in the White House. Either way, we are going to have a party uh, and two parties in Congress, for that matter, who are anti-worker, anti-union. And that's why uh, it's not an automatic thing. It's not, it's not automatic in the sense that every union leader who breaks from Harris is going to do historic service towards the agenda of building a new party. But I also think we have to be realistic. We can't hold our breath for many of these labor leaders to do anything because they have gushingly endorsed Harris. And that's why I would urge as a former rank and file union member myself, that if you're watching this and you're a union member and you agree with me that we need an alternative to Harris and Trump and to the two parties of big business, then join Workers Strike Back, contact us so that we can help you put forward a resolution in your union local to rescind your union's endorsement of Harris and put forward the message that the union movement should say no to Harris, no to Trump. We need a party for the working class. How do people get involved with Workers Strike Back? So you can go to uh, our website, Workers Strike Back, all one word, workersstrikeback.org. I urge you to get involved. There's a join form. You can join us. And uh, today, sorry, this is going to air uh, tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, on Tuesday, August 20th, we are having a rally uh, at uh, uh, Brace Church in Logan Square in Chicago. I don't I don't know if that's going to be useful, but let me say the other message. Um, and in addition to joining Workers Strike Back, uh, I would also like to share that starting September and October, we are going to have monthly Workers Strike Back meetings in person in Chicago, Kansas City, Boston, and Seattle and also a national Zoom meeting. So if you live in one of those cities, join us in person, fill out the form on Worker Strike Back website, or if you are in any other city, you can still be part of Worker Strike Back. Join us at our national monthly Zoom call. We need to get organized. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thank you.